Hello and welcome to this edition of the Google Fast Marketers podcast. I'm Will Perkin. I'm the curator of Google Fast Marketers and the founder of the consultancy business Only Dead Fish. So Fast Marketers is of course the uh, quarterly series of uh, live events that we ran at Google for eight years and we ran over about 16 years at the time. But we've now pivoted to virtual like many of the things in the pandemic and we're running uh, this series of short podcasts. And so we're interviewing some of the most well-respected people in the industry and asking them to answer five questions. So what's the best thing you've learned in your career to date? What's the biggest mistake that you've made in your career? And what did you learn from it? Uh, what's your key insights into how marketing and advertising is changing? And what's your key prediction for the future of planning and marketing? And then finally, what question do you wish that I'd ask you? And what's the year I would do it? Which is my kind of typical question at the end. Uh, so fast after the course has always been about hearing from um, the most interesting and interested people in the industry and uh, today's guest is no exception we're lucky to have uh, sue Uniman, uh, who's the uh, chief transformation officer at MediaCom. so uh, sue if you mind just uh, introducing yourself hi hello yeah i'm very flattered to be here um, and uh, regarded as an interesting person um thank you very much so i'm chief transformation officer at MediaCom. i've been at MediaCom for a very long time in fact um July marked 30 years, which oh, wow. is quite extraordinary. So I imagine that I'm older than um, what proportion of your um, uh, listeners weren't born when I started my career at uh, what was the media business? I, I wonder, quite a large proportion. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, the media business was pretty young anyway, isn't it? So, um, yeah. and, so yeah. um, and obviously the industry has changed like loads in that time and it's been a story of transformation actually my career has been a story of transformation but i think that the kinds of transformations that are going on at the moment it's it's a cliche to now say that it's unprecedented it's a cliche to say that we've all adapted how we work more than we ever would um without um the pandemic that's locked us down um and is now just gradually easing up but I think the transformations that we're going to see over the, in our industry over the next weeks and months and years are going to be very bracing. So I guess that's part of what we're going to talk about um, yeah. today. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Um, so let's take that, that 30 year career and just think about um, learning. Because we always start really this podcast by asking people about the best thing that they've learned really in their career. It's a good place to kind of uh, really start with um uh, useful kind of insight and feedback and uh, so if I could just ask that question for you um, yeah. over that kind of work, what is the best thing that you've learned? So the best thing that I've learned is to keep learning um, I would say that that uh, it's as simple as that you, you, you never know everything everything's changing the whole time you benefit from having experience of things but only if you're open to the fact that things are changing all the time and um, this year I uh, or everybody at Mediacom committed to learning one new skill. Um, now we made that commitment rather naively in January, and um, some of us have learned new skills that we would rather wish that we hadn't had to learn. I think because right. the times have been very difficult, and business decisions have been very difficult. But the new skill that I learned is that I am now a qualified Scrum Master. Um, oh, really? So. We're adopting agile ways of working. I know this is very close to your heart, Neil, at Mediacom properly and at scale. Um, and I am, uh, as I say, now a qualified Scrum Master and indeed have add, added Scrum Mastering to my other kind of daily work duties. Um, That's really fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it'd be good to delve into that a bit more, actually, because um, obviously it's a, a, a subject which is quite close to my heart. But um, the whole kind of agile principles and principles of Scrum, I mean, how do you see them being applied to the work of a media agency? What, what sort of bit can you use and what bits can you not? So clearly they were designed for um, a, a different sector, but so many of the principles just apply to waste management. And those are the ones that we're using. So waste management, um, running a, a Kanban in Teams planner has been yeah. revolutionary. I'd say um, one of my colleagues who's part of our agile leadership team at MediaCom, Nigel Robinson, has just written a blog actually, which we're just about to publish. It may or may not be out depending on the timing of this, where he talked about the fact that a team of us, um, I formed a team of agile leadership um, people before we had the training to organize everything that we needed to get done. Um, and we're all driven, motivated, experienced people. 
once we'd done the training and we'd learned about Kanbans and scrums and sprints and retrospectives and waste management, um, our productivity has gone up. I mean, I'm not, I, 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 I want to say tenfold. I mean, we've sort of astonished ourselves at the huge difference that that process has made to us. Um, and I yeah. think that in a business that's going to undergo even more strain than ever before, there are two things, and I'll talk about the other one I hope a bit later, that are crucial. One is we are going to be required to give our clients more for less. And for all those people out there who are going, well, it's just impossible, actually it isn't. And it isn't because there are efficiencies in how we work and how we work with our clients and with creative agency partners and media owners that can be transformed. Um, and that's what Agile is doing for us. The other huge adaption that has to happen is to do with diversity, inclusion and belonging. Um, and that's the other thing that, as you know, is very dear to my heart. But, yeah. it, and in fact, the other workshop that I've recently been in was a microaggressions workshop, which um, is being um, rolled out across all of Mediacom. So we're doing compulsory microaggressions training for everybody. And again, that has been, some of it was familiar to me because of my writing, but listening to 200 people talk about that issue, um, in, a, in a sense, it's outrageous because the other thing about having worked 30 years is that I can assure everybody out there that none of those issues are new issues. You know, the, the, it, you know the, the kinds of things that we are addressing now have been around all of my adult life. And the fact that so much of our industry still doesn't account for them is no light matter. Um, so that's the other thing where there's big change. But so, so I've had a, a lot of learning this year, and I'd say literally the best thing that I've ever learned was to keep on learning. And I think I might have learned that as a child. So that's one of those things that kind of goes way back. Yeah, that's a really good mission to, to live by, I think. Um, I kind of, in, just before we leave that subject, I'm just interested about um, what you were saying there about, I mean, one of the things about Agile, of course, is multidisciplinary working and concurrent working. <laughs> Yeah. which I think, you know, on client side, I see really being very transformational in the way in which clients work and that, that sort of move away from the sort of handoff processes, which can be very inefficient, and the ability to have different disciplines sparking off each other and working concurrently. Yeah. But also the need to bring in that kind of um, psychological safety, communication norms on the team to depoliticize and just make the team work and move fast. Um, have you found the things that you've I, I agree with you. The emotional side of it is underrepresented in Agile's reputation, right? right. And it's one of the thing, one of the reasons, because as you know, Mediacom, the people first special results, our, our main motivation for doing it is to make people happier, feel that they're empowered, feel able to collaborate. One of the user stories, so here I am using the jargon from one of the teams that are piloting it, was that um, somebody said, since they started using Agile ways of working, um, clearly, physically, they've never been further apart from their team members, but emotionally, they feel they're closer together, they're sharing more, they're supporting each other. And the fact that you don't sit on problems, that you every day go, what's blocking me? And then somebody will go, well, I think I can help you with that. That right. spirit is needed more, more than ever. Um, and we do, we do say the, you know, agile mantra when we come to our retrospectives, which is that we are going into this, because the retrospective, obviously, you do some criticism of, of, of yourself and, and the people around you, so feedback. And we do go into it saying, we are starting this on the basis that we believe that everybody has done their absolute best in the most professional manner that they can, and that any criticism is just to try and solve more problems. So yeah. I, I, we are having an absolute honeymoon with Agile um, at the moment, I have to say. Um, right. And working with, um, <clears throat> we've been very fortunate, we've got a, um, uh, quite a company, a coding company in the north called Code Computer Lab, who did our training for us um, at scale. And just honestly, I will never forget a six unforgettable half days at the end of May, which have changed my work-life balance, actually. 
That's amazing. That's fantastic. And one of the things also with Agile, I guess, is, is um, about learning from successes and failures, talking about mm-hmm. learning. And so it brings me to my, my next question about learning from mistakes and failures. I mean, is there a particular failure or mistake or something in your career which you look back on and you think that was a big learning for me? Yeah, there's, a, there's my, there's my um, the time that I was, I'm not going to name names because, you know, after all this is going public, but there was the time when I was um, invited by my uh, then global CEO to go and meet a new business prospect who is a um, famously argumentative entrepreneur in charge of a business. And um, I got thrown out of the meeting. No one else got thrown out of the meeting. I got thrown out of the meeting. Um, Why? And, well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a reasonably long story, but I'll, I'll try and summarize it. Basically, we uh, met him, and this is, as you can say, as you can might imagine, this is like all my kind of most senior colleagues that have been handpicked to go along to this meeting. And we go and meet him, and, and for a bit, he talks to us about his business and how good he is at his business. And um, uh, he's quite um, provocative in the way in which he does that. So sort of he, he shows us the product that he sells and he, he throws some questions at um, uh, his guests as, as we go around. So for example, he talks about um, one product that uh, he had um, uh, wanted the factory to buy, uh, or the, sorry, the buyers to stock, um, and the buyers said, no, 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 I, I, I don't think it's going to be any good. And he insisted that they brought in, you know, half a million of them. And, um, and then he pointed his finger, and I, I'll imagine that you were in the room, Neil. He pointed his finger and he said, so you, 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 Neil, how many of them do you think I sold? And you would say, you, you wouldn't have a clue, right? And he'd go, no, no, you wouldn't have a clue. That's why I'm successful and you're not. And so this went on and on and on. Oh, and got, I, I think I annoyed him over some mental arithmetic. So what happened was that we reached another product and um, he said, look, this was on sale for uh, 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 three for two, but um, the uh, punters weren't buying it. And again, they wanted to return it to the supplier. And I said, uh, no, don't, don't return it to the supplier. Make it 30% off instead. Individual items, 30% off instead. And they sold out. And then he looked at me and he went, you, he said, do you know the difference between three for two and 30% off? Now, actually, Neil, my mental arithmetic is quite good. And so I do know the difference between three for two and 30% off, even under stress. And I think being under stress was what made me say, yes, I do know it's 3%. 33% off versus 30% off. Right. And he said, uh, are you sure? Are you sure? At which point I wasn't sure of anything at all, but I barely sure that there's the three percent. He said no. He said no. He said there's no bloody difference. And of course, in a sense, he was right. I mean, I was being. He just thought I was being annoying, and I genuinely didn't think I was being annoying. I just wasn't. Right. I was just. Yeah. Anyway, then we we then went to the next part of the meeting, and the brief had been to go and take a brief for the meeting, not to go in with ideas. And um, this man talked for a bit more and he said how good he was and how he wasn't even sure that he needed media agency or anything like that. And then um, uh, then he turned to uh, my boss and he said, anyway, he said, uh, what are your ideas? Now, bear in mind, we hadn't taken them, but my boss turned to me and sort of as the person who was supposed to have the ideas and went. To. And I had done some homework, so I'd been oh. around the stores and I, I come up with two or three ideas and so I do my level best without any props to explain these two ideas and this man listens to me it's, it's all right it's good to listen to me and then he says uh why well, he goes I'll tell you what I think of those ideas he goes number one it's just rubbish he goes number three would take too long number two I think you've got something there and I'm so you can as you might imagine I'm sort of thinking oh I think I've got something there he said uh he said, but I'm never going to do that. He said, so I don't know why you come here with that idea. He said, do you know what? You haven't wowed me and you haven't entertained me. And there's a pause. And then at that point, this is what I said. And what I said was, well, I haven't come here to wow you or entertain you. I've come here to talk to you about a business that needs proper advice. And if you'd like to do that a bit more, let's do that. And I guess if you don't want to do that more, 
I, I should go, I'll, I'll get my coat. And he went, go on then, go. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, but he then said, go on then, go. Everyone else stayed. I get shown out by his, well, not, well, not quite by security, but by his PA. Yeah. Um, and I was very, very, very upset. I felt like I'd let everybody down. Uh, I basically, I had, I'd had the afternoon. So this, this, there's a couple of outcomes from this because I did think about because you know I'm a th- I, I analyze, so I, I, you know, I'm a planner. I think about things. So I did think about this quite a lot. And um, what I did was I went home because I had the afternoon off to go and see one of the kids in a school concert, and I just went straight home. It was about eleven o'clock, and um, I told my husband about it. And then I said, "Is there any chocolate in the house?" And he he lied to me because I know there was cho- he had chocolate, and he said no. And I know where he keeps his chocolate, but it, I, I, frankly, he it's very very kind of high quality dark chocolate. That wasn't what I had in mind. So I said, "Well, I'm going to go and buy some chocolate then." And he went, "You know, what meant? To, what am I meant to do? Am I meant to stop you?" And I said, "Well, you can." I, I said, I, "I don't know what you're meant to do. I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to try and stop it." <laughs> So I went and I got some chocolate and I ate too much chocolate because when I'm under stress, Neil, to be honest, I, alcohol and drugs are not of no interest to me whatsoever. <laughs> Why I wanted some chocolate. Maybe Chris was eating chocolate. Good chocolate. And then after I'd eaten too much chocolate, I'd got a call from my boss, actually, um, from my, uh, from, from my um, uh, immediate boss, um, who said to me, look, don't worry about it, Sue. He said, look, we've got far more important things to think about than this. It's very kind of him, but I was very upset. And then I went along to the school concert. And the thing about me, and I know we know each other a bit, is that I cannot hide how I'm feeling. And I've now stopped trying to hide how I'm feeling. But when I walk in a room, everybody knows how I'm feeling. And um, one of my close friends, who was another mum at the school, took one look at me and said, um, you know, are you Okay. And I said, oh, you know, not really. And she said, well, what's up? And I said, well, I had a bad day at work. And she said, oh, she said, tell me about it. And then I just, thankfully, I looked at her. And again, she didn't look herself. And I said, are you okay? And she said, no, I've had a very, very bad morning at work. And I said, what is a bad morning at work for you? Um, And she's a a consultant um, at a hospital. And she said, I had to tell the parents of um, a 16-year-old that the kid wasn't going to make it. Oh, God. And I suddenly thought, okay, my bad day, not so bad. So that's one of the learnings is have, have some perspective. The other learning is casting, right? So a lot to do with having a good meeting is about casting the right people in the meeting. And... Um, my kind of professional uh, think about, about this was that, look, if you want Meg Ryan in the movie, you don't cast Susan Sarandon. You know, if you want, if you want, you know, uh, uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger, you know, you don't cast, I don't know, um, Dustin Hoffman or whatever. It's, it's get your casting right. Um, and that, I would say, both of those things were very valuable lessons from what at the time was an absolute hideous experience, although I have told the story. <laughs> Amazing. That's a brilliant story. Thank you. Um, so let's get back to what you were saying earlier about the um, where the industry is at at the moment. I'm just curious to get your insights here because, um, in fact, I'm going to combine the next two questions because one is around just the insight, you know, your key insight for where the industry is at at the moment, and then the next one's kind of forward looking. But I guess we're talking really about um, the same thing. So, I mean, what, what's your observation really about where we are now um, as an industry, as agencies, and what's likely to come? So, I, I, th- I think they are connected. I'm not sure if, if I think I've got a two part answer. I think, um, in terms of, uh, sustainability in its broadest sense so sustainability i do not think that something that we are i think it's a new um way in which we need to conduct our business and when i say sustainability in the broadest sense i mean long term medium term rather than just short term thinking so as you know, I'm, I've just chaired the IPA Effectiveness Awards. I haven't chaired them. Steve Spring is the chair. She'll be very cross from saying that. I have convened the IPA Effectiveness Awards, as is only right for an industry judge. Um, but I've just read lots and lots of them. Um, 
and that whole balance of effectiveness and short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. I mean, the awards are, a, a, you know, a, a kind of like a, a, an exercise in those, those brands and agencies and companies that have taken medium to long-term thinking as something that's important. Right. Um, you and I have seen something happen in the industry um, over the time that we've both been in it, whereby um, direct response short-term marketing has been rebranded as performance marketing, has become far, far more um, uh, expert and important because it used to not have the importance that it deserved. Now, I think it's very important that we make sure that we think about sustainable future of brands in that sense. But the other thing that I mean about sustainability is I mean um, diversity and inclusion. Um, I don't think the industry has changed enough. I am stunned, really, um, that some sectors of the industry are taking as long to change as, as they are, um, and how many new companies there are um, 20th century ways of doing business and recruiting people are still as, as strong as they ever were. So I yeah. think, um, I, I heard uh, Sarah Jenkins um, talk about this the other day and she was talking about the fact that you know there's there's much less talk about purpose communications at the moment and she was saying perhaps that's because it's not about purpose which sounds perhaps like something that's a nice to have but it's about businesses doing their duty and doing their duty by in terms of um transforming their working practices but also in terms of um creating um businesses that have the benefit of diverse processes, personalities, um, people, people of different backgrounds. Um, some of those areas, you know, there's so many areas we're not even measuring yet, let alone trying to improve. But I think that in terms of predictions, um, I was thinking about the, um, I was thinking about machine learning, I was thinking about AI, I'm reading a book about um, machine learning how to be human in an age of machine learning at the moment. Um, and I was reminded of the dynamo story that you tell in your book about dynamos in factories that um, just to remind everybody that um, originally when electricity came to the factory, the factory factories used to be built around steam engines. And so they just replaced the steam engine with the dynamo and there were some efficiencies, but no real change. And it wasn't until I think the depression of the 1930s that where suddenly new thinkers came in, there was an, I think an influx of um, people from uh, uh, refugees from um, Europe that went to America, brought new ideas. And suddenly the factories got rearranged and reimagined around the real use of electricity, which is that you can organize people who are working in groups together and then the electricity can go to them. Um, and I think as far as machine learning and AI is concerned, I think we are still operating like a steam factory rather than creating new ways of working um, across the sector. And so my key prediction is, is that as ever, there will be change, but as ever, the winners will be the people that change in terms of sustainability in its broadest sense, but also rearrange rearrange their factory. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. There's, there's a lot in there. So I'm going to come back to a couple of those things, if I may. Yeah. But um, what you're saying about short-termism is interesting because arguably if we're coming into a pretty big recession, um, then horizons tend to shrink and it's all about you know, managing cash flow and you know the immediate things. So what can agencies do, do you think, to to work more long-term with their clients to kind of encourage that kind of sustainability and long-term thinking. So I'm plugging the IPA quite a lot here, but there's a, a document that they produced, I think last year with the FT called the Board Brand Rift, which is what I used to say, um, which pointed out that most uh, Excos, um, and this was global research, most Excos do understand the idea of brand. They think that brands are important, but most of them say they've got absolutely no idea what brand building is or um, any of the language of brand building. 
So one of the key points was use the language of the boardroom, um, redefine. There are still companies where the marketing budget is regarded as a cost, not even an investment, but as a cost. Certainly not regarded as, as I think the recommendations in this document say, as something that actually drives revenue. And I think you know, there, there, there isn't really a choice between short term and, and medium to long term. Because any brand that purely runs on short term runs out of steam. So, it's, so we know that. So clearly, you need a combination and a mix of, the, of both. But I think what agencies need to do is they need to start helping our, our marketing clients, our CMOs, to um, get the rest of the board on board with it. Because the, 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 you know, one of my takeouts from um, reading the awards this year, and I read a, a lot of them, so you know there are about 4,000 words each, and I didn't read every single one, but I must have read easily 50, 55 of them. Um, the, the, the lesson is, is effectiveness needs to be part of business culture and marketing effectiveness needs to be part of business culture. And you can no more leave effectiveness to just a few strategists or researchers or econometricians than you can leave the diversity and inclusion agenda of the company just leave, you, you cannot leave that to the HR department and no more yeah. than you can leave the culture of the agency to um, a team of people. That's something that everybody has to take responsibility for. So um, just, just on that diversity and inclusion point, I mean, it, it's, it is really interesting what's happened, I think, over the last few months to, to hi, kind of highlight that and, and the lack of progress in the industry. But that, that point about taking ownership and everybody taking ownership of that, not just the department. What do you think, what's your advice for what people can do to take ownership of that agenda within their own sphere and their agency and the wider industry? So I'm a firm believer that you must and can lead from every seat. And the simplest action that I think everyone can take, everyone's been a bystander for something uncomfortable, either said or done. Um, everyone's either consciously or unconsciously just kind of gone along with a traditional way of doing something that reinforces the current status quo. If everybody spoke up, if everybody said something, not necessarily on their own behalf, on behalf of somebody else, mm. then our industry would transform. So that would be my big ask to everybody who's listening is next time say something. Brilliant. Uh, and just, I want to come back to that machine learning point and just looking forward as well, because it's a really interesting way of thinking about um, what you need to unlearn and, and relearn, you know? So, so one way that I talk to my clients about that is the kind of difference, I suppose, between optimization and transformation. It's like you can apply these technologies to just get better, bigger, faster, more efficient, or you could also, you know, where do you transform? That's something very different. There's lots of value in both of those things. So do you, what, what's the struggle that we have to around unlearning things to just, you know, take it apart and put it back together in a different way? Is there any kind of guidance or advice you have around identifying? Listen, there's a brilliant opportunity at the moment, right? Because um, businesses that are over reliant on econometrics and I, I love econometrics and I love our econometricians and Jane Christian, who runs our, our business science team in, in the London agency is one of my heroes. But she will say, as I will say, that it is entirely possible to optimize to a suboptimal position. And that if you optimize for efficiency rather than growth, then you will, you will stop growing and your efficiencies will go up, but only to a certain point. Um, and I think there's a big opportunity at the moment because econometrics is dark. So, there, and this is just one point, I suppose, because econometrics isn't everything. But um, econometricians like dark periods in advertising, so they like it when things get switched off. But they also need occasions that are like other occasions. Um, so um, they don't like massive change. Um, and I think econometrics for 2020, what are we going to do? Now, that 
combined with the um, advances in machine learning, 5G coming our way, but, you know, one way or another, it's, it's on its way, um, creates a massive moment for innovation. And that businesses that have been worried about innovation now can actually take this opportunity to try some things. And I would say, of course, is uh, to try things in an agile way, which is to start lots of kind of, you know, experiments and, and see which ones take off. So I'd say there is, there is a, it's incumbent on agencies at the moment to be making recommendations to clients to try new things. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. I think we've got about five minutes left, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, ask my final question here, which is my kind of catch-all question, really. Yeah. But um, so, so the That's question, the question. Is, well, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's not. It. The, <laughs> but uh, so the question is, of course, what what do you wish that I'd ask you, and um, and what's your answer? So, so what's your thought on that? Um, I wish that you'd ask me what my ambition is, and my answer to my ambition is that we see a step change in terms of diversity, inclusion, and belonging at work. So as you probably, as well, I know you know, I, I, my last book was published in 2016, The Glass Wall, and that was about gender diversity. Got a yeah. new book coming out um, October 29th, um, which is called uh, Belonging, which is about diversity, inclusion, and um, equality and belonging at work. And it examines the slightly controversial idea actually that the billions that have been spent on diversity and inclusion actually have not made a massive difference in terms of outcome um, right. and uh with co-authors catherine and also catherine jacob again but also mark edwards because um we wanted a perspective from a man and also someone who's who's created lots of kind of training and uh, exercises around it we examine the situation we tell lots and lots of stories from lots of different sorts of people about why they feel that they struggle to belong at work. Um, and we offer some advice and some solutions. I believe this has been on the agenda this year more than ever before. However, I think as we return to the office and some people return and some people don't return and I don't think any of us are thinking we're going to go back to the office in exactly the same way. I think there is a real question around culture, social capital, um, how if you're an outlier to a, a, a company's culture, how you fit in if you're not even in the office. It's, it's, you can't even pretend to fit in at the moment. Yeah. And I think you know, my ambition is, is that we see real change in that respect. I think I think it's um, uh, this is an opportunity, isn't it? I mean, we're we're seeing a reset in many things, and and this is an opportunity, perhaps, for reset in that space as well. I mean, it's, um, I hope so. I mean, the reset so far isn't going particularly well, in the sense yeah. that um, you know most women have reverted to being nineteen fifties housewives as well as having their career, right. and the advantage of having a stay at home partner whose job it is to at home look after do do that do do the work of the home and look after the children that advantage has um heightened at the moment um yeah. so it's by no means plain sailing um the other thing is is that uh businesses are exerting more control from the top and even though we've talked about agile and empowering everybody there is also a return to tighter control from the top, which does still tend to be populated factually by um, white middle-aged men. I mean, that's just the, the truth of it. That's who's yeah. dominating boards. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think we're going to sail into change. I think we have to create change. And um, I would like everybody to join the campaign for the change. Brilliant. So um, we ran out of time, unfortunately, but that was amazing and um, brilliant to have you on the Fast Answer podcast. So um, thank you for your time and uh, for that. That's brilliant. And um, thanks for everybody for tuning in. So um, stay tuned for more Fast Answer podcasts and more interesting interviewees. So thank you very much. Steve. Thank you.